Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to the podcast. Pat Flynn here, world-renowned salsa dancer, joined by Professor Dr. Jim Madden. And we're going to talk about... Dancer. Yeah, I promised. <laughs> yeah. And uh, internationally known opera singer, chief yeah. engineer at NASA. The list continues. But we're, we're here to... President elect. Yeah, President <laughs> We're here to discuss... Uh, back to basics today. You know, um, Jim, you've been teaching, but we've been a little bit busy... Had uh, some heavy episodes, boy. We had Gavin on last week, and yeah, we just went, we just went into some real tall metaphysical grass. It was great, but I'm like, you know, this is this channel is philosophy for the people. So every every once in a while, we got to zoom back out. We got to get back to basics, and uh, I thought it might be fun just to uh, no agenda here, just see what comes out. Uh, talk about like let's make a case for philosophy. You know how how can philosophy improve your life? Maybe it can also ruin your life. We'll we'll, we'll consider that option as well. Mm -hmm make the appeal for people to uh, to make that critically reflective turn, maybe share some personal experience of her own. And then if people have any questions, we can jam on those. How's that sound? Good, sir. Good. But before we go in, give us some updates, man. What have you been, what have you been thinking about? What have you been working on? Well, I, I had, I had sort of something of a tour of North Carolina. Um, nice. So I gave, I gave a little lecture at North Carolina, Wilmington. Um, and then I gave a lecture for the Tomisk Institute at North, uh, North Carolina State University. This was all like that first week of March, right? So I did I did sort of make my home for a while in North Carolina. So that yeah, was the most recent thing I did. I, you know, I, I like North Carolina. That's where yeah. my dear wife is from. Yeah. So I've spent a fair amount of time in the Raleigh area and um, always found it hospitable and mostly charming. And um, right. yeah, I'm, I'm a fan of it. Wouldn't right. live there. I had, I had a good time. Yeah, but liked it. Uh, real quick, I saw you had a few new blog posts up. Why don't we just mention those before we get into it? Yeah, so I, I, I basically have finished my series in the UFO on uh, my Substack. So feel free to help yourself to that. <laughs> your jam, right? I think that's probably my my. I, don't know I love that you say that with a laugh. Is it? <laughs> no, no, I'm, but I'm as you know, I'm perfectly serious about it. Right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so my uh, my my uh, I, I do have there's. There, I don't have them sequenced, but there's four up there that, that deal with, with the issue. So, nice. uh, yeah. And, um, my next one, I'm thinking of doing, uh, one on there's, there's, this, this is where I'm getting now. I'm going to do it on Plato's Atlantis myth. So nice. Yeah. yeah I could I'm tell there was a little movie. sparkle in your eye when we were working through that in yeah. Timaeus, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I got this thing. I think I can connect the like Iscalus's Prometheus and, um, Plato's Atlantis myth. And then, you know, later Francis Bacon uh, writes a little novella uh, called The New Atlantis, right? So I think yeah, you can yeah. kind of see. Which, which everybody should read. Yeah. that's uh, That should be like, yeah, that's definitely um, mandatory. I had, I, had, I, had to, I had to read that one of my classes years ago. I, I should read it. a guy who's saying the quiet part aloud. There it is, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and I think there's a way I can, I can use that to sort of talk about, um, the pre-philosophical moment in the tragedians, the philosophical moment in Plato, and then the modernity, uh, and a hint of post-modernity in the new Atlantis. So yeah, so nice. I think that might be my next essay. Yeah. Well, we'll see if we can turn it into an episode at some point. Okay, yeah. professor. So look, you've been teaching for many years. You obviously get some mm -hmm. students who probably... Maybe your class wasn't their first choice. All right. So you got any that weren't that way. That's <laughs> so you gotta sell them, right? You gotta sell uh and maybe that maybe this is maybe this whole notion of trying to sell somebody on philosophy is misguided or perverted. Yeah. But I guess if you had to try and do it, I'd like to start to hear your appeal, if you sure. wouldn't mind. And then we can let yeah. the conversation build from there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um I have two I have two approaches to it. Okay. Great. Um, one, I, I take basically from something, uh, that really struck me from Hegel's preface to his lesser logic. Okay. And another one is, is one I take from kind of reading, uh, the opening sections of, um, Aristotle's metaphysics and, uh, a certain chapter from Marx's capital as like germinating each other. Okay, yeah. so I have a weird way of doing this. Okay, I like it. I dig it. So, the first one is okay when when Hegel opens uh, his his logic, he says, you know, every discipline begins somewhere. 
Okay, so and by that he means there's a certain set of assumptions we have to make for a discipline to get off the ground, like first principles mm -hmm. of some sort. It's not his language, but that's what he means, right? Right. And he says that every discipline um, has to operate within those principles, okay? Mm -hmm. And and what he has in mind there is sort of like, look, if you're if you go to your chemistry class, you're going to kind of take the scientific method as a given, and you're not going to like, as an act of chemistry, put the scientific method into question, right? Yeah. Because like, by what 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 would our standard be within chemistry, right? Uh, for judging the scientific method, because because chemistry is built on the scientific method. So there's no non self referentially defeating way for chemistry to question its first principle. Mm -hmm. Okay. So within the scientific method, everything we do in chemistry is something for which we could give reasons, but we can't give reasons as chemists for the scientific method. It's it's, it's a higher order thing. Okay. Right. And then Hegel says, you know, basically, so everything, every discipline uh, takes something as a given and, and is methodologically unable to question it. Okay. And he says his philosophy is the discipline that puts its own starting point into question. Yeah. Okay. And by doing that, it puts all starting points into question. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's like, so what's the difference between say chemistry and philosophy of science? Well, because in philosophy of science, we like put the question, you know, we put to question the very method of science. So we're not doing science anymore. Now we're doing philosophy of science. Right. And, and Hegel's view is like, you know, what, what philosophy is, is then the thing that puts all human method, right. To question doesn't take as a given. Right. But he realizes there's sort of a, there's sort of a, a problem here because then like, you know, in, how do we do that? How can we like put ourselves in, into question? Right. And so, you know, so for Hegel, then there's a serious risk we might worry about that this might end badly, right. That we might come up unable to give reasons for our ultimate method of reasons giving right so there's a risk to it there's a risk to philosophy right, right. So you it to, takes a little bit of courage is a point i was going to make yeah, yeah. because mm -hmm. like it could it could end up like you can't get out of that puzzle right? <laughs> yeah right yeah yeah okay could end and, up in a real nasty pit of nihilism right yeah mm -hmm. and so i think hegel has a sense of this he's like it's philosophy is high stakes right it, mm -hmm. it could end up in the ultimate in his view this is where it does end up in the ultimate vindicate vindication of things right or it could end up in utter nihilism, right? Yeah. Okay. And and, and that's a, yeah, let's pause right there. That's yeah. rich. Yeah. Because that, rich. that's actually a point I wanted to make is that philosophy really does take courage. Because if you understand those stakes, boy, that's a that's a scary thought, right? Scary Especially thought. if you're not sure at the outset which way things are going to turn. There's something kind of attractive of like not even wanting to look further down that road. You know yeah. what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, and like the thing of Plato, Plato would say, hey, maybe a lot of people ought not go monkeying with this, right? <laughs> because, right, it's not going to work out well for them because they're going to raise puzzles that they can't answer. And, you know, they're going to get out of their lane and they're going to try to run Athens. And that's a bad idea. Right. Right. Yeah. right? Yeah. Another hugely important point. Right. So that was yeah. kind of what I was indicating. And I'm sure you've, you've seen this. I mean, we, we've both seen it. Right. So I think for me uh, and look, I've taken some nasty turns philosophically. Uh, but I think I'm I'm definitely more in, on Hegel's side of things than the nihilistic side of things. Yeah. But boy, man, it, I've seen philosophy really screw some people up too, yeah. um, like yeah. psychologically, right? Uh, so it's Absolutely. not it's not something to be like just like all rainbows yeah. and, and unicorns here. Like uh, I think a, a what I would argue is a bad philosophy uh, can really mess with things, yeah. uh, not just the individual, but of course the wider society that such individuals are, are so, in. So let that be known. Mm -hmm. The way I like to put it is, is I, I think you could define a philosopher in like the Socratic sense is someone who cares so much about their existence that they won't allow it to be a sham. Right. It's sort of like, if you really, really value your marriage, right. And you had the suspicion that maybe, this wasn't what it seemed you would want to know right mm -hmm. because you value it right because because you love it you wouldn't tolerate it being a sham right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i think like who are the philosophers is somebody who's so concerned who's so careful and you know ha as having care for existence right for being mm -hmm. that they won't tolerate the sneaking suspicion that it might be a sham so even <laughs> if it's high stakes right that you right. might come to like dark conclusions Mm -hmm. And there's no guarantee like philosophy is no holds barred. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's no guarantee it's going to come out well that the philosopher is someone who, who would rather know because they yeah. care. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And so, um, so I think that that's one way I motivate the students is that, you know, um, this is sort of Hegelian way. Like what is philosophy? It's the thing you do when you won't accept your existence as a sham and you don't yeah. know if it's a sham or not until you go sniffing around. Right? That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Until you like hire that private investigator to tell your wife. Right? No. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> mm -hmm. right. so I, I really, I really like this because the point I, it ties directly into one of the points I wanted to make is that philosophy may be risky business. And if you're going to do it and you're going to try to do it well, it takes courage because you're yeah. not sure from the outset where it's going to, to wind up. But pretty early on, you could see that there were options on the table that uh, might be pretty absurd. And uh, they seem like live options, at least starting out. That's not the most comforting thought. But also, you know, within that arena, uh, there are br there are brilliant people who defend the most absurd positions. Yeah. And you have to you have to battle with them. Right. Yeah. Like everybody's a freaking everyone's minimally a black belt. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right? No, and, and you might have to live with the fact that there are people smarter than you uh, that disagree with you. Yeah. Right. Right. And 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 that's that's a fact that may hang around. You might not be able to get rid of that fact. Right. right? Yeah. Right. So yeah. that's that's there's there's a lot of battle here. Uh, there's a lot of of difficult terrain. And there's the, the other point I want to make about how it requires but i think also helps to develop courage and other virtues that philosophy of course not only helps you to i think understand what virtue is but helps you to actually develop it is that at least for me jim and i'm sure this is the case for you it's it's never like you get to a perfectly comfortable place right there's right. always new challenges right. there are always new new puzzles right now right. maybe you you build a certain character where you become more robust and resilient in the face of such challenges. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you never, you never get the coziness factor. No. My wife, my wife invented that term, the coziness factor. It's I like that. Yeah. You like that? Actually, <laughs> but that ain't, there ain't no coziness yeah. factor about philosophy, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I should mention too, I have a, uh, I do have a three part series on my sub stack on this topic. on like what philosophy is in, in, in this vein, it, there's a, it's called philosophy and locality and locality and there's three parts to it so the first part's on hegel and his conception of philosophy second part's on plato and his conception of philosophy and the third's on merleau ponty and his conception of philosophy so yeah. if anyone wants to go deep on this i've got three essays out there on this on this exact way of framing it yeah and um jim's sub stacks are not low fat my friends <laughs> they're not right now, right now. it's like i'm trying to have as small of an audience as possible <laughs> 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 right. you know, so. which is brilliant i love it yeah i know yeah it's, yeah all, all right. right so yeah so what are what are some all right keep selling us then i mean because right now i mean that's always kind of a like a potentially good sell like as soon as you you tell people that maybe not everyone should monkey with this uh, everyone's like huh. no i'm the man yeah 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 challenge and, accepted and also, professor. like proposing to them that for all they know their life is a sham mm -hmm. right because here's the deal like maybe it's maybe it would be better than if not everybody had that proposal made to them Right. Yeah. Okay. But I didn't decide to put these people in the room with me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? And so if I'm there and I have been tasked to teach philosophy, it's going to be like, you know, the real thing. And I'm going to say, here's the deal. For all you know, your life's a sham. Mm -hmm. You could drop the class and do something else with your life. But here's the deal. I've been tasked to do this. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know what I mean? So um, now my, but my other way that I do it is, okay. So, um if you if you read the book one first couple chapters of aristotle's metaphysics right he talks about you know there there's all these sciences but there's one that's the the greatest one right he even calls it the divine science there okay mm -hmm. and it's divine in two senses it's the science the gods would have and it's the science that's concerned with the gods right right okay and he, he goes out, he, but he asks, like, okay, like, among these sciences, what's the greatest one? And he says the greatest one, in part, is the divine science because it is absolutely the one that is most useless. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. There's nothing you get out of this but simply the reward of doing the divine science in and of itself, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, and, 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 you know, because he says, well, there could be no ulterior motive for studying this, right? It's not going to help you like, you know, understand the weather better. It's not going to help you, you know, um, you know, pick up chicks, right? It's not going to help you know stuff, right? Um, and, and, 
and so the only reason you would do it is because it's intrinsically worthwhile right so like for aristotle the fact that something is useless but some people still want to do it is to him a sign that it's more valuable than things that are useful right and the fact that what well, people will do it even contrary to their material interests shows it's more valuable okay right mm -hmm. and and so and, and and so this is me kind of pushing back against my institution and a lot of the you know institutions in higher ed who like mm -hmm. are trying to justified the existence of liberal arts by saying well it'll make you a it'll make you better in your corporate cubicle job because you'll be a better writer and a you know a better thinker and a better critical thinker and whatever that is all this stuff uh -huh. and by the way the social science in that doesn't i don't think it actually bears out that well but but the point is is well aristotle would say that's to miss the very point of the thing right that, you know, if you're doing this for those reasons it's not actually you're not doing it right Do you, you know what i mean and Anyway, and so then and, and the, the thing I take from Marx is that I actually talk to them about some of the things that Marx has to say about surplus value and alienation and about how like what we've done to ourselves is we've 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 commodified everything. Right. And there are very few things even about ourselves that we don't think of as ter in terms of something that can be bought and sold for some kind of profit. Right. Like yeah. everything to us is a means to some other end. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, Marx is pretty clear and he's not wrong on this. Like there's a, a kind of nihilism that looms with that. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's a kind of uneasiness. He calls it alienation that looms with that. OK. And so, I, you know, I, I, tell, I get, try to use that to get the students to see is, yeah, the fact that what I'm doing for you here is utterly useless in any terms that you would recognize shows how badly you've been wrecked by the mind, right okay and the fact that, that you can't see a value to anything that isn't like tradable a commodity yeah. commodity right and i and i pressed them like okay if that's how you think about yourself then what's the point of your life like tradable commodity to what end indeed right, right. End? yeah and so i actually use an interesting way like strange bedfellows there i use marks to motivate the aristotelian like, yeah theory. hey well see our series on marcusa on that yeah, right exactly. yeah mm -hmm. and actually mark mark cites aristotle and all that stuff yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. look i've obviously got disagreements with the some of the yeah. wider paradigm there but like you i think that there are a lot of genuinely valuable insights yeah. to be mined but right? there's more to life than what can be bought and sold right yeah i'm into that brother yeah, yeah. So, wow. Well, after after your um, statements, the other things I have are kind of <laughs> less exciting. I was just going to be like, hey, philosophy can help you think straight and get more truth. Yeah. And if you think that's a good thing, well, maybe you should like yeah. philosophy, right? It's kind of <laughs> yeah. It is, right? I mean, but it won't help day, you or... pick up women. So but Yeah, like, uh, hey there, uh, baby, did you know that there's no non-contradictory, non-elliptical construal of atomic sentences that the form A exists? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, yeah. Wait, wait. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, yeah, I, so I think that's still right, right? Most of us still kind of, I think that's right, hold the assumption that truth is sort of a good thing. We, we kind of want it, or at least we want to kind of avoid error. Philosophy can can help with that, I think. Doesn't doesn't mean you're going to guarantee, guaranteed you're going to get to all the truth you can handle, all the truth you can eat, but it help you, yeah. helps you to avoid mistakes. I think that's a good, a good thing. Yeah. Uh, it can help you to believe different things, I think better things, or it might help you to believe the same things in a much more refined and sophisticated sense yeah. as well, which I think is important, right? And that comes down to what you're talking about, about those assumptions. You might, your assumptions might not be wrong in a lot right. of cases, but they might need to be refined. Right. And by having them examined and refined, you can often come out with a, a wider understanding of, of the world and your position in it and, and a justification for the things you believe. And I think that's a good thing, or you might realize you have to give some things up, but either way, if you think that truth is ultimately the target and that's a valuable thing, philosophy can get you there. Uh, in terms of other virtues, we mentioned courage. So we kind of jumped the gun on that, yeah. but humility too, man, like you said, a lot of brilliant people out there. Uh, yeah. It's, it's like martial arts, right? If, if you're not kind of a humble person, when you start martial arts, like if you're serious about it, you're going to be, you're going to become one pretty quick. Right. Yeah. Um, or you're just going to become like broken, like right. severely broken. Right. And same thing with philosophy. Right. Uh, you, you will learn to have a sort of humble strength if you keep doing it well. But it will be a humble strength because you will understand, OK, there's a lot of really smart people out there. Uh, I clearly am not the container of all the correct answers all the time. It uh, doesn't mean you're going to be like shouldn't be like a coward and never assert anything or argue anything. But there's a, a sort of carefulness. Yeah that can be developed. I think a, a, a prudence there. I'd like to hear your thoughts on all that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, something I was going to say is, is, you know, 
we have to be careful too in distinguishing how you know philosophy as um uh a an academic discipline in the modern western university is transacted in like what its self-conception of it is yep. as opposed to like say what if socrates had in mind by, or a bo or a boethius or boethius yeah had in mind in identifying himself as a philosopher right mm -hmm. because you know what's going on in universities especially research universities is this is an attempt like there's always an attempt being made to justify the existence of philosophy as an academic discipline in a in the modern mostly scientifically oriented research university okay? correct and that mm -hmm. like being couched in that kind of like institutional authoritative bureaucratic structure is utterly foreign to everything like the founders of like what we think of western philosophy as or, right <laughs> right yeah see, see what i mean and so so a lot of times like you know like just using an example well, we have to justify this in terms of like like liberal arts as as a means of preparing you to be absorbed into the capitalist machine right it's it's not what socrates was up to You're, at all right? no you offense know, but you're, you're technically i guess a sophist to your job right <laughs> yeah yeah and, and you know and, and it's interesting you know i i had been away and, I, and i'm not looking to pick a fight with any of our friends who are like very dedicated analytic philosophers right I mean, that's my <laughs> training too okay but i had been away from reading a lot of like very um like i've been away from analytic philosophy for a while and this uh, these other things i've been much more classically and like phenomenally oriented but for a current research project that Pat and I were talking about before the show that I have up and running, I've been like getting back into a lot of like more recent analytic literature and, and, and just, just strikes me how much like this is just, you know, that this silly, is silly it, games. Just say yeah, well, yeah, a lot of silly, silly games. games. Yeah. Yeah. That, but I was going to go with like, this is, this is basically, you know, a, a way of kind of transacting a kind of philosophical business that just fits the research program of the modern university yeah right the, you know what i mean that like makes it saleable in the idiom right and the bureaucratic structure of you know the modern university which is all built around the scientific method right mm -hmm. and so in many ways it does it really does seem to concede its role as like philosophy as, as the handmaid of the scientific method right yeah mm -hmm. um and that's just not that's just not what that's not what hegel had in mind for it mm -hmm. right i mean though he's a university guy right but but he's my point, right? I do. Um, and so I think a lot of times we, we let that bureaucratic, you know, I would say authoritative institutional structure define the discipline for us, right? Because that's where we're all trained, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that's foreign to its actual origins, I think. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I agree. I was just actually, it's a book I pick up again quite regularly. But boy, going back to Boethius on just pretty much anything, there's such a, I don't know a life to his philosophy same with plato right there's a there's like a life to it yeah that you, <laughs> i don't think i've ever thought of a piece of analytic philosophy right that right, right. <laughs> there's that there's something that is is i don't know it can be embodied in a sense right mm -hmm. um maybe you know helping to write a philosophical lament on the you know and on your on in death row is is some, contributes that energy or something like that right yeah yeah there's not a skin in the yeah. game anymore maybe that's a problem and, and i'm yeah. and i'm not i'm not like an anti-analytic philosopher right mm -hmm. and that, that, for me it'd be like now like, it'd be like to be self-loathing in a lot of ways right yeah um but i and i do think there's much to learn from it and there's a place for it right i'm just saying is like it seems to me, and I think you can make the case for a lot of like kind of philosophy too, is any philosophy coming out of the contemporary university, I think is tainted by the environment it's come out of. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So where would you counsel the, the gentle listener mm -hmm. maybe to begin? I know we've given some, some reading lists before. I don't know if we want to reiterate those, but mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you know, maybe it's maybe it's not in the the academic circles. I'd just be curious to hear your somebody somebody just heard your appeal. They just come on the podcast yeah. by al algorithm al Al Gore's rhythm <laughs> al, al, brought Gore's, him, yeah. al Gore's rhythm brought them right to this podcast, and they're like, I never knew what that stuff was, that philosophy stuff, but I'm sold, Professor Jim. <laughs> Help me get started. Yeah. What do they have to do? <laughs> you know, I mean, like, like first of all, this is. 
this is gonna be, be really like wooey here, right? But I mean, thinking about stuff and talking to people about stuff is the most important part of it, right? So, you know, I, I do think, you know, building friendships with people that man, you know, we are on the same wavelength because one of the other points I had here is that philosophy can help you make friends and like good yeah. friends, like really yeah. good friends. And obviously good friends good, can help you be a philosopher. Yeah. yeah. And we right. could fawn fawn here. And I really do consider you a great friend in the relationship that, that we form. But like even this weekend, you know, I have a sort of men's group that gets together and it's philosophically and, and religiously oriented. I just was reflecting on like, this is a great group of friends, right? We yeah. just, we sit around and we try to talk about the nature of things. Um, yeah. We care about the big questions. Like, this is, but like, if I wasn't interested in these types of things, I just wouldn't have those types of friendships. Right. But those yeah. friendships also facilitate my going deeper into those things. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, like, like we, we've both listed a lot of books that we like to would have people start with and things like that. But I don't think the exact books where you start are that important. Right. Mm -hmm. I think that, that you're reading something that really, really interests you and you're going to take it up, not just to get through it, but to actually understand it. Right. And you have someone to talk about <laughs> it with, that's what's most important. Right. So, you know, if, if you, you think it'd be really sexy to read Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil, start with Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil. Right. And just, you know, just, you know, work your way through that and, and, and talk to somebody about it. Right. And, or if you think it'd be really cool to, Start with the Summa, start with the Summa, right? I mean, um, especially if you're essentially a hobbyist, right? Okay, then then I would let my interests guide me. And don't think where you start is actually going to be, you know, uh, really determinative of how this thing goes. Like you might, you know, you might like read, you know, um, you know, some essay by Leibniz, right? and get that and you know play with that for a while and then realize oh wait no he's he's actually citing plato's phaedo here now and now now i'm motivated to go back and like very very careful about phaedo i just i think pick something up read it whether it's a classic or it's something contemporary or it's an intro or whatever and and then really digest it talk about it and follow the footnotes right? yeah that's beautiful got time for a few questions here professor yeah, of course, of course. let's do it i see lots of good stuff in the comments and guys great to see all of you thanks for being here Samuel, Andrew, Brendan, Meow Meow, Julio. The gangs back together. Here. Yeah, we got the whole gangs in town. We got to do like, dude, we got to do an in-person event soon. Get, yeah, all, true, get, this, get this whole crew together. What yeah. would you guys think about that? Maybe Would, maybe, would you maybe guys go to Waukesha? In, yeah, maybe even I was just going to say Waukesha, Wisconsin. Maybe. Let's do it. Let's do it. Maybe, I don't know. I, it probably wouldn't. I shouldn't say this on air. I don't know if you could have a philosophy for the people conference at Bennett in college. Dude. I think that is something to be investigated. I know a guy. All right. Stay tuned. Gentle listen. We'll see what we can do. I mean, minimally, I'll just rent the park in my neighborhood. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, it'll be fun. Trust me. Trust me. All right. Let's uh, let's see what we got here. Uh, I'm Andrew... just picture you on the, my front porch playing the national anthem like Jimi Hendrix style. Dude, man, I got I just put it up on Instagram. Uh, for anyone who's interested in, in me playing the national anthem as I'm going to rip it at the upcoming Little League game, head over to Instagram to for more uh distortion than you could possibly handle. Nice. nice. All right, Andrew's got a comment. McIntyre's reminder that we can't be practical reasoners without growth and virtue has made philosophy very practical. More of a comment than a question, but perhaps yep. you have some comments on the comment. No. As always, great to hear it's from perfect, Andrew. It's a perfect comment. Andrew, I owe, you, I owe you a reply to a question you raised in my Substack. I just noticed. So I'll get you there. Great. Stay tuned, Andrew. The Stay professor's tuned. on it. All right. Brendan says, what would you say to people to take the dive into philosophy, but step back after reading so many, uh, or just feeling more lost than ever, wondering if anyone, if any, has any right? Yeah, dude, I've, I've been there. I've Welcome certainly been there. Um, I the yeah, welcome to the club. I would, I guess, the only thing I would say is just keep going. Just yeah, you, just would, like you, just have to keep going, right? And and there will be times when you feel like right. your feet, like well, you're just hanging out in midair, like what the yeah. hell is going on here, yeah. right? That's that's. I think if you don't get to that point, then you just haven't done it, right? <laughs> like yeah. you, you, you haven't really started. Mm -hmm. Yep. Otherwise, I think what you were looking for was an ad hoc justification for what you brought, and you're not putting your your locality, your beginning, into question, a la Hegel, right? Yeah. 
Right. Yeah. So just just keep going. That's it. That's the only thing I can possibly think of to say about that. Uh, Andrew's got another comment that might invite some comments. He says the comfortability factor or what my wife calls the coziness factor, the CF, just shows how integral the idea of desire is to philosophy. Human desire is never completely satisfied. We always desire more than we have. This is not greed. Yeah. Yeah, very good. And, and uh, I think he actually brought up it's in one of the comments, the mention of eros, right? You know, love, okay. right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, human reason is not ever indifferent, right? And it cannot be separate from desire. At least that is definitely the Plato and Aristotle's view, right? Uh, and I think there's much to be said for that. Yes, indeed. All right. Let me just, sorry, just looking through here. Lots of good stuff in the comments, guys. Thanks for, this was a totally unscheduled stream. So cool to right. see everyone just hopping on. We really, in, yeah. this is always a lot of fun. Uh, Julio says, which side does Jim take on the McDowell-Dreyfus debate? Based on his latest blog post, he seems to concede the Dreyfus that the background of meaning is non-conceptual. Is this an accurate presentation of your views, Jim? Yeah, it is. But it, it's unclear that McDowell actually disagrees with that. Uh, I think... I think one of the, one of the toughest things about the McDowell debate is actually McDowell Dreyfus debate is actually getting to where a place where McDowell thinks they actually disagree. Okay, now at the end of the day, though, I think if given the way that debates often caricatured, maybe sometimes we'll just do a full episode on it. I would we should probably, yeah probably come out on the side of a McDowell right, mm -hmm. but really like the new book is my like a big chunk, a big piece of the argument is my attempting to kind of have it both ways. Right? Yeah. So we have to do, and Julio might have commented this. I put up another post uh, just asking for some suggestions and it's come up a number of times that we have to do a second conversation with you and Gavin on mind and world. Right, that, cool. uh, that right. first one has stuck with yeah. a lot of people and it would relate to, cool. to this question. That was so one it, of our best shows, I think. That yeah. was, yeah, that was, if people yeah. have not seen that, I will just uh, put in yeah. the little Googler YouTube machine, yeah. all of our names and, and that episode should, should populate. Please uh, yeah. enjoy that. Uh, and, I thought it was phenomenal. Yeah, just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. go, going back to Julio's good question here is um, there's an anthology that the title is escaping me right now. Maybe it's just called being in the world. Uh, it's an anthology on the McDowell Dreyfus debate, and there's a guy in there who named Lee Braver who has a paper in that anthology. And I think Braver's position on it is pretty darn close to what I would where I would stick my claim. So, cool. cool. And his book Groundless Grounds would be kind of you know would be that's Braver's book Groundless Grounds would, would kind of come out where I am with that. Yeah, great. We will try to coordinate something with Gavin here in the not too distant future as well. All right. Uh, Brendan says, what space is there for mysticism next to philosophy? I thought about this much, Jim. I'm looking for Maritan around here. I usually yeah. have. Let's see here. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not quite sure just because, you know, like one can mean a lot by mysticism, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I do I do think, if I'm understanding the question yeah, correctly, Brendan, find. that um, I think in my own view, and this might be my, my showing my uh, Dreyfus side of the McDowell Dreyfus debate. There's a certain point where you know philosophy is going to get you only so far, and you're going to kick that ladder away. And there's still maybe more. If if it can't be said, there's still maybe more to be seen, right? Than what philosophy can possibly deliver. So, I think yeah, there is a place for mysticism next to it. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. All right, let's see. Julio wants to know how do you get into Hegel? That's a tough one. All right, that's a very hard one. Um, there's a there's a great uh, commentary on Hegel's um, phenomenology of spirit by a guy named Kalkovich. Um, I highly recommend that. Right, just read that while working your way through the relevant sections of the phenomenology is a good place. Um, Robert Brandom has a little book. It was actually his Aquinas lecture that he gave at Marquette a few years ago. Um, and it's sort of a, it's a very, very condensed precy of his magnum opus on Hegel called, um, magnanimity and trust is, is the, is yeah. Magnanimity and trust is the name of the lecture from Marquette. You can buy it as a book on Amazon, right? That's, and it's maybe, maybe 80 pages. It's a pretty easy. Now, if you're dealing with Brandon, you're dealing with a very opinionated introduction to Hegel. Okay. Also, um, 
Charles Taylor wrote two books on Hegel. There's one, the big one, and there's another one, there's a little one. The little one's called Hegel in Modern Society. I think that's a very good place to start on Hegel too, right? Yeah. And uh, also McIntyre, like the young McIntyre had a few very interesting essays on Hegel, but McIntyre is never really a good place to start for anything. Right? <laughs> well, I love yeah, that's, that's That's probably true. That's probably true. Uh, Julio says, if you guys thought of uploading maybe as a subsec, a list of, of what are essential reads in a philosophical education. Well, I've recommended before, just, yeah. get, just get Adler's How to Read a Book and flip to the first appendix. And he's got yeah. his great books curriculum right there. I honestly yeah. think that you can't go wrong with that um that'll keep you busy for your entire life i don't know if there's any and we have done an episode on it before uh, we at least did a book share episode not too long ago that we thought were our own personal essential reads but yeah are you are you on board with the great books curriculum professor um i guess i want to know at what level it's happening okay mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. i'm i'm rather skeptical of that sort of thing for primary education because mainly these books were not intended for primary education. And then I think, and what I find with a lot of my own students that have come through those kind of like classical high school programs and stuff that they think they know a lot more than they do. And they've been, sure. kind of dragged, they've been dragged through things. And I, and I, I worry that they have it, they've just checked the box without like anything. Yeah. Really I'm not saying all case, there's some exceptions, right? So, so wait till you're 37 yeah. before you begin. Yeah. Or, yeah. or you, you know what I mean? Like, you know, and so, I have nothing against this, but I really wonder at the end of the day how much good is done by it. And maybe that like maybe we should look at how the people who wrote the great books would have actually educated minor children and it would not have been by reading the text that they were writing for like adult consumption. Right? Yeah. Well, this relates. I'll just grab uh Andrew's other question here real quick because he says I'm in um oh wait, sorry. This is a response to a question. Yeah, but I think it makes the point though. Yeah, go with it. Yeah. Okay, yeah, he's just agreeing. Is just agreeing with you, because yeah. somebody wanted to know, well, why, why don't we see something like, I guess, the great books? Uh, here we go. Uh, why isn't philosophy taught aside other core areas like history and language arts and math in our K twelve curriculum? I did uh, just pull this up because I wanted to share it with people. This is a good resource. Um, this is my second copy of it. Um, I lose books a lot. Does that happen to you, Jim? You just lose books. Yeah, I have found uh, those books. I, 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 I make the mistake of like loaning them to students. Well, this is this is this is a good one. We're going to be using this more with our children. The Trivium yeah. by um, Sister Miriam Joseph. If anyone, it's just kind of a good. Well, it's the Trivium, right? Mm -hmm. Um, it was just sitting here, so I felt like I I had to. I had to mention it. All right, good. Let's just do one or two more, and then we got to wrap this up. Raymond wants to know, I think this is in relation to our Timaeus mm -hmm. series. He wants to know if there's a scholar or an article that supports our, our, our I guess it was our interpretation to my Timaeus as a sort of theodicy. Oh, interesting. Uh, I'm not, gosh, I don't know. I haven't really looked at a lot of secondary yeah. stuff on um, the Timaeus. I don't know. Um yeah. And I think we tried to, maybe we weren't clear about this, but on, on that episode, it wasn't, it wasn't even like it was, because I think the sort of context of a theodicy is this, you've got the God hypothesis or something like that, right? And then yeah. you have to give some sort of story um, to give some sort of God justifying reason for yeah. the bad stuff of the world, right? But what we're saying, I think what we were trying to say with the, with the Timaeus is that, um, He's not trying to give like a God justifying reason. He's like, no, this just has to be, it's th to be the case yeah. Yeah. given the fundamental principle. Yeah. That, right. Yeah. And, so and, I, I and, and, this. yeah. and that's the a, that's a, it, misleading here. yeah, it yeah. is misleading, yeah. but one might think that you could yeah. turn that into a sort of theodicy, yeah. but I think contextually so, it's quite different project that's going on. Right. Yeah. So, and actually I talk about this in that Substack series um, yeah. that for Plato and Hegel, right. Um, what philosophy is, is an attempt at the justification of existence, right? Mm -hmm. And we tend to think of that solely in terms of a kind of like epistemic justification, right? Do, you know what I mean? Um, whereas for Plato, it is primarily a moral justification. Like he, it, this is very clear in Plato. He does not think you have uh, reasons for something being the case until you have reasons as to why it is the case based on some kind of ethical ideal right 
very clear in this in the Phaedo, and I think it's very clear in this in in the Timaeus, right? So when I say it's a it's a it's a theodicy, it's not because Plato has this preconceived idea of a creating deity, right? That he's trying to like defend against atheistic objections, right? It's that for Plato, he's he is trying to provide a certain kind of explanation, which he thinks is the only ultimately satisfying explanation for yeah. all of existence, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And that's that's right. And that's and that's if you have not seen our episode on the Timaeus, then uh, check it out. Or episodes. We did a we did a three part series on that. All right, uh, one more, and we're done. Jim, do you want to pick the uh, the oh, closer yeah, I'm, today? I'm anything yeah. anything catching your eye? Thanks for all the great stuff, guys. Wish we could stay and jam all day, but I got to go pick up my other guitar. My guitar's been in the shop, and I got to go pick it up. Um, let's see here. This interesting question. Bookish Brendan, which philosopher's life story, not philosophy, is your favorite? Right. Uh, Pat, I bet you've got one there. I'm looking, man. I always look at like what's just in my immediate vicinity. Um, I mean, there's like some cliche ones that, you know, really do resonate with me, uh, but they're kind of ones that everyone picks. But I guess sometimes I'm lame like that. Uh, like Augustine does resonate with me mm -hmm. a lot if you want to just you know, classify him as a, as a philosopher. Um, like Aquinas's life story is cool, but it doesn't really resonate with me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Boethius, obviously, yeah, you know, assuming that most of those accounts are, are somewhat uh, accurate. Um, And to be and to be perfectly frank, there's a lot of philosophies that I've I've studied their work a lot, but I, I probably don't know a whole lot about their actual yeah. life. You yeah. know what I mean? Um, yeah. And they probably have a really interesting life story, uh, and I'm just largely ignorant of it. Or some like I know a little bit about their life, like Maritain. I know, like, but like Bernard Lonergan, who I spent a lot of time on his thought, I know almost nothing about his life at all. Um, and there's probably a lot of thinkers like that. Uh, same thing with Barry Miller. You know, he's a guy who spent an enormous amount of time on his thought. I, yeah. I know very little about the man's, what what his actual life was like, aside from a few anecdotes here or there. So, yeah, I don't have an, a great one off the top of my head. So why don't you go and I'll think about it for another minute or two. You know, I've, um, I've actually been interested in the biographies of some of these uh World War II generation philosophers, people like Merleau-Ponty, people like Sartre, right? Um, people like Hans Jonas, who had been through the World War II experience, and it clearly, clearly was a game changer in a lot of what they thought. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. right? Like, uh, you know, like, like Merleau-Ponty, in my understanding, like prior to the war, would have been a fairly committed Marxist and came out of it unable to commit to much of anything at all anymore, ideologically, right? Right. Though, still a man of the left right mm -hmm. I, I just that sort of thing like these people who you can see their philosophy is affected by things that originate far outside of that that silly bureaucratic university context right mm -hmm. and that they're actually they've lived through you know matters of world historical significance right and uh it's in their writing at that level right and i think i think maybe like if you haven't like suffered Nazi occupation, then maybe you're not going to be able to do that. <laughs> so, yeah. right? you know, mm -hmm. like, like anything you or I will do will be so God, God willing, will be more boring than that. Right? Yes. Yeah. God willing yeah. is right, dude. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. That's a good question, man. I just don't have a, a good one off the, yeah. the, the top of my head aside from some of those, the cliched, I mean, but they're cliche for a reason, right? Yeah. Some of those life stories are, are really quite inspiring. Uh, all right. Well, we're going to leave it there. So thanks for tuning in, everyone. Thanks for hopping on this uh, little live stream. Mm -hmm. And of course, I would like to hear from all of you uh, after the stream. Leave a comment. As you know, co the comments, uh, they help Al Gore's rhythm. And we want to we want to do that. Uh, and let us know what philosophy has done for you and your life, for better or worse. We'd love to, to hear and read about that afterwards. In the meantime, Jim, anything you want to mention or say before we go? Uh, philosophy of is giving me an immensely easy job. So <laughs> <laughs> nothing else. That. Maybe you could just coast through life. Right? Yeah. Basically <laughs> coast through middle age. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if we couldn't hook you in any other way, right? Just, yeah. So if there is that at the end of the day. Right? That. Yeah. So. Great. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, share, subscribe, comment after the stream. We'll catch you next time. Adios. Peace.